Um, it's appealing about flying the Tiger Moth. It's the nearest thing you'll get to um, the basic flying as it used to be between the wars or, or during the First World War period. Because inherently the Tiger Moth is really First World War technology. And uh, it's real seed of the pants flying. You use very little in terms of instruments. It's real stick and rudder work. Um, it's, uh, it's relatively easy to fly the Tiger Moth, but to fly it well and to land it nicely is, is a real challenge. So when you do that, um, when you can master that, um, it uh, gives you a real plus, a real boost. It requires skill to fly it accurately. I think a lot of people quickly able to fly it, but to fly it accurately in balance, uh, I think there's no other aircraft to show it up. The reason I learned to fly in a Tiger Moth is because basically it's just so much more fun than flying a modern plane. Um, it's much more about flying by the feel of it than it is about monitoring your instruments all the time. Um, and also it's more of a challenge to fly and to land well than it is to, uh, with a modern plane. Also it's got a certain amount of history behind it and I find just the look of the plane is uh, really appealing and just makes you want to get in it and fly it. I'll point out the various instruments and you can see here this is the airspeed indicator which in this Tiger Moth's in uh, knots. Uh, going across the panel in the centre you've got a turn and slip indicator. The top needle um, is the slip indicator and it tells uh, basically it tells you whether the aircraft's balanced and uh, you coordinate your rudder movements uh, with this instrument. A turn indicator's at the bottom, and you can see this starts at uh, zero and goes up to four, and that's rate of turn. Uh, RPM indicator for the uh, engine speed, and normally the Tiger Moth's operating uh, anywhere between 1800 to 2000 revs. Uh, this is the compass used for navigation. It's a very accurate compass and it enables you to steer very accurate headings, much more accurate than a bubble compass which you'll find in uh, modern aircraft. Very, very good compass. Altimeter, pressure altimeter, which you set the different pressure settings here with the subscale. And this um, controls the elevators in the fore and aft movement, uh, elevators on the tailplane, and controls the ailerons uh, on the ends of the wings. So in this direction, it, it, um, the ailerons create roll, and in this, in this direction, the elevators change the pitch attitude, either up or down. We use the rudder pedals down the bottom of the cockpit there. Uh, they're connected, uh, obviously, to the rudder, and their main use on the ground is to uh, steer the airplane, they're connected to the tail skid as well. And uh, in the air, the rudder is used to keep the airplane in balance. Going around the rest of the cockpit the throttle control is here and it's closed there fully open and we have a control down here which is fuel on and off and a trim control uh, on just by your left uh, left knee is the elevator trimmer and the object of that is to um, you set the trimmer so that it takes all the control loads out of the stick so the aircraft will fly level if you take your hand off the joystick momentarily, the airplane will fly level and balanced. Right, what we'll do is just walk around the aircraft and uh, look and show you a few of the, of the points we're looking at before we fly it. One would uh, check to make the, sure the attachment to the fuselage is secure. There's not a lot of loose movement there. This is the oil tank. And uh, one of the, the checks, the most important checks of course, are that there's enough fuel and oil in the airplane to safely operate it. So one of the checks would be to check the oil level, which I'm undoing the filler cap. And there you can see where the oil level is, it's well above the halfway, so that's completely safe to operate the airplane. So we check the propeller for any um, 
any cracks so we're checking the uh, leading edge and the back side of the propeller see if there's any marks or cracks in the propeller and of course it's most important to make sure we've got enough fuel on board the airplane so we always climb up have a look visually uh, in the top of the top of the tank One of the things on the Tiger Moth is that it um, doesn't have an electric starter um, as it was originally designed. There are a few operating in the world that do have electric starters these days, but truly original Tiger Moths are always um, started by swinging the propeller by hand. So uh, that in itself is a, is, a experience, is a skill that has to be mastered and learned to do it safely. The Tiger Moth is vastly different on the ground than a modern airplane which has got brakes and tail and a nose wheel steering. The Tiger Moth uh, is an art in taxiing it alone and of course the takeoff and landing are a real art. Takeoff on the Tiger Moth is uh, basically similar to most tail wheel airplanes or in this case the Tiger Moth's a tail skid unless it's one operated in Australia where they use a lot of uh, Tiger Moth's modified with the tail wheel and brakes. But assuming it's a classic Tiger Moth with tail skid, it's important to note where the wind direction is in relation to the runway, whether you're going to have a crosswind from the left or the right. Um, because you'll need to hold the aileron into the, into the crosswind, into the wind. Uh, important to get the airplane straight, the tail wheel, tail skid straight before you start applying power. Um, so smoothly bring the power up. Um, and a quick glance at the oil pressure gauge to make sure the oil pressure is staying good. Uh, as the aircraft uh, picks up speed, concentrate on keeping it directionally straight with the rudder. And very shortly you'll be able to get the tail up, uh, which means moving the um, stick forward, uh, which will raise the tail. At the same time, you need a little bit of left rudder because due to the um, gyroscopic effect of the propeller will tend to, uh, the aircraft will tend to veer to the right.
I think aerobatics in any airplane improves your confidence in the aircraft. As long as you don't overdo it, of course. And you can overdo it. Another reason why I like flying Tiger Moths is because you can do basic aerobatics in them. This is good because not only is it great fun, but also it teaches you better handling skills and improves your confidence as a pilot. Probably the best aerobatic or the easiest aerobatic would be the loop because a Tiger Moth you can loop without even using the engine. To do a loop, basically what you do is you push the stick forwards and dive the plane to get some speed. Then as you pull back, you apply full power, pull the stick progressively further back towards your stomach. As you see the horizon come up, reduce the power until it's closed. Uh, put on a touch of right rudder just to keep the wings level and then pull it around the bottom half of the loop until you're back into straight and level flight when you reapply power. A spin is what happens when you stall the plane while also yawing. In order to get out of one, you first make sure the throttle is closed, which you probably would be if you're in a spin. You then apply full opposite rudder to the direction the plane is rotating in, followed by forward stick. It should then come out of the spin fairly quickly, within half to one turn. You then just gently pull back in the stick and ease the plane out of the dive until it's back into level flight. To do a half reverse cubin, you uh, build up speed just like you would for any aerobatic maneuver in the Tiger Moth. Uh, you then pull the nose up to 30 to 45 degrees above the horizon. You then roll it over 180 degrees so you're upside down using the aileron and rudder and then you just pull it through what would be the bottom half of a loop until you come back into level flight. The barrel roll is one of the slightly more challenging manoeuvres you can do in a Tiger Moth. You lower the nose to gain 120 miles per hour. You then pull back in a stick to take the nose 30 to 40 degrees above the horizon and then roll it over in either direction using the ailerons and the rudder. As you become inverted, you pull back gently on the stick to pull yourself into the turn and you also take off the throttle so that you don't accelerate towards the ground. You then just carry on pulling round uh, the barrel, so to speak, until you come back into straight and level flight. To do a stall turn, you apply full power and bring the speed up to about 100 miles per hour. You then look out to one of your wings as a reference point and pour back in a stick so that you're going up at about 80 degrees, so almost straight up. Then, once you've been going up for a bit, and you have to mind to do this quickly and not leave it too long, because if you leave it too long, you'll simply stall and fall away. As you get to the top, you apply full rudder in either direction, so that you go round, and then dive towards the ground, and as you're doing that, you just ease out of that, back into level flow. The ideal landing in the Tiger Moth, of course, and the classic landing is the three-point landing, um, which is quite an art to develop to, to do it nicely. And it's when all the two wheels and the tail skid all uh, contact the ground at the same time. So as you're coming down the approach, and probably with it virtually in the glide or with only a little bit of power on, bring the stick back so the airplane's flying initially um, just parallel with the ground and probably four or five feet above it and speed will start to decay just check the stick back uh, as the speed's decaying to stop the aircraft sinking 
and the nose will come up. At that point, you should start sinking a little bit, so just stick back, stick back. As it sinks gently down, you should get it skimming just over the ground, a few inches above the ground. And as it finally sinks, a little snatch back on the stick, firmly back. And if the stick's right back, uh, the airplane will settle nicely on all three points. Of course, as you're doing this, you're keeping the airplane the wings level and in balance with the rudder. And uh, as soon as it's on the ground, it's important to, if, assuming you've got no crosswind, to keep the stick right back and keep it straight with the rudder. The other type of landing on the Tiger Moth, which is not the classical landing really, which is the classical ones, the three pointers we discussed, uh, you'd use a wheeler landing mainly if you're landing on a hard runway, a concrete or asphalt runway, as it gives you more control. You'd also use it if you've got crosswind probably of more than about seven or eight knots. You'd want to use a, a wheeler landing because again it gives you more control. And the third time you'd use a um, wheeler landing because there's a lot of turbulence or wind shear where you, you really want to, you don't want to be sitting in a three point attitude uh, for very long. So as you come down the approach, it's shallower approach than a glide approach for the three pointer. You're coming down on the last bit of the approach, 60 miles an hour looking with about 12 to 1300 RPM on. Slower speed, 60 rather than 65 which you'd be for the three pointer. And Road, um, start the round out um, probably about 20 feet, a little bit lower than the three point landing. And the aim now is to skim the airplane horizontally just above the surface, keeping the, the, the t in the level attitude. So you're not raising the nose so much as you would in the three point, only just a little bit. So the idea is to that the airplane touches with the wheels on first, with the tail up. Uh, the moment the airplane touches with the wheels on the ground, uh, one should close the throttle and apply a little forward pressure on the stick uh, because the airplane will tend to probably just tend to bounce a little bit. So you need a little check forward on the stick the moment the, um, the wheels touch the uh, grass or the tarmac. And then holding, moving the stick gently forward to keep the airplane in the level flight condition as it were until it want, the tail wants, you feel the tail wants to come down and you virtually run out of forward stick and then let the tail come down and move the stick back. I think to fly it accurately you've got to know what you're doing and um, in that respect it's not the easiest airplane to fly accurately but anyone can fly it. Well, the Tiger Moth's a fantastic airplane. It, um, if you learn to fly on a Tiger Moth or you convert to one, it'll teach you more about aviation, light aviation probably, than any other modern airplane. Uh, it's got a lot, um, the controls are uncoordinated, it's not easy to land, and you have to be very aware of the wind direction and what's going on around you. So in that respect, the Tiger Moth is one of the best trainers that um, are around in the world even today, despite the fact the airplane is 70 years old. Um, once you fly a flying Tiger Moth, you can get in probably any other light plane and uh, fly it very quickly with a minimal conversion period. As I said to you earlier on, probably the world's worst airplane by modern standards. Uh, high centre of gravity, narrow undercarriage, low bottom main planes, drafty, no brakes, uh, not all that comfortable, you can't adjust the seat, but um, fly it accurately and the satisfaction is your reward. <clears throat> I personally think this is still a very good trainer. 